now you, uh, there is going to be coming up on the screen as a backdrop for Psalm 78, Joshua Michael Stewart, who is my first grandson, Sarah Nelson, who, or Sarah House, who uh, put together our PowerPoint, just had to find a way to get the new grandchild into the PowerPoint slide. So there he is. So Psalm 78, the passage that we built the first talk around, says, we will not hide from Joshua or from his generation, but tell him the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might, the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob. He appointed a law in Israel, which he, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know him. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So this is the goal of all of our teaching, that children will put their hope in God. In other words, that they would put their hope in the gospel and that they would put their trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins and the fulfillment of all his promises to them, even eternal life. Pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones again explains what it means to embrace the gospel. It, the gospel, can satisfy man's mind completely. It can move his heart entirely and it can lead to wholehearted obedience in the will. That is the gospel. Christ has died that we might be complete men, not merely that parts of us may be saved, not that we might be lopsided Christians, but that there may be a balanced finality about us. Truth comes to the mind and to the understanding enlightened by the Holy Spirit. Then having seen the truth, the Christian loves it. It moves his heart. He sees what he, ha he was and he sees the life he was living and he hates it. If you see the truth about yourself as a slave of sin, you will hate yourself. Then as you see the glorious truth about the love of Christ, you will want it, you will desire it. So the heart is engaged. Truly, to see the truth means that you are moved by it and that you love it. You can't help it. If you see the truth clearly, you must feel it. And then that, in turn, leads to this, that your greatest desire will be to practice it and live it. We must always put things in the right order. It's the truth first. The heart is always to be influenced through the understanding the mind, then the heart, then the will. So we just spent the second session talking about imparting the truth and teaching students to grasp the meaning of scripture. In other words, to influence them through the mind. And this is a very biblical concept. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. However, it's important, as important as teaching the mind is, Lloyd-Jones rightly states, we must always put things in the right order. It's truth first. The heart is always to be influenced through the understanding, the mind, and then the heart, and then the will. But God forbid that anyone should think that it ends with the intellect. It starts there, but it goes on. It then moves to the heart, and finally, the man yields his will. He obeys, not grudgingly or unwillingly, but with the whole heart. The Christian life is a glorious, perfect life that takes up and captivates the entire personality. So we're Wanting to think about in this, sex, this section that connection between the, the intellect, the mind, and the heart. And how do we bring that about in our teaching? So first, 
we want to emphasize that interacting with the Word of God is a means to encourage faith. Most of us would agree that it is good to encourage children to be active participants in the learning process. Most of us could even give us reasons why it's good that children should be these active participants. It makes the lessons more interesting, and therefore it helps the children to pay attention. It's easy for their minds to wander if all they're doing is listening to someone talk. Students do not get bored if they are actively participating in the learning process. Children will often remember the concepts longer if they've been involved in the learning process. When children are involved in the discovery of the knowledge themselves, sometimes they can internalize it better. Discovering the Bible truth sometimes causing, causes the truth to be embraced in the heart rather than just understood in the head. These are all true, but, but how to get children involved seems to be the greater challenge for people. Now there's the total hands-on approach where children where the child is actively involved in learning in the learning activity but often when when that's all when there's all this busyness when the child is just actively engaged in everything the outcome is that the children often will have a lot of fun but the experience itself tends to consume time and even though some subject matter is, is absorbed very significant very little significant learning has occurred. We can sometimes make the mistake in equating activity with active learning. By active learning, we mean that the mind is actively engaged, not necessarily the body. Now, again, please don't misunderstand. We're not against children getting up and writing on the board and participating in role plays and demonstrations and putting together visuals and being active while physically while they learn. And we're not opposed to them, certainly not opposed to them having a good time while they do that. In fact, we encourage that, especially in the younger ages. But active learning goes beyond activity. Active learning involves children's minds interacting with the subject matter. They are thinking, they're discovering, they're imagining, they're questioning, they're organizing, they're analyzing, they're evaluating, they're drawing conclusions and applying the material. If we just sit children down and tell them what they are to believe, they may not be a comprehending what we want them to comprehend. They may not be agreeing with it or internalizing the truth. At the same time, it may be true that if we ask them to act out a Bible story or to retell a story or to recite a Bible verse, they might also not be comprehending. They may also not be agreeing with it. We want them to be able to look at a biblical text, carefully observe and rightly observe, inter interpret that text. We want to be able to make real the application of that truth to their own lives and eventually we want them to respond in faith to the truth. They want we want them to embrace it, to own it, to live by it, to be willing to die for it. When children are little, we must tell them much of what they need to learn and understand. They're like sponges soaking up everything. But by fifth grade, when they're beginning to think more critically, we need to add more dialogue with the children. We need to be asking more questions and expecting them to answer. By leading children and youth logically through a series of questions designed to lead them to correct conclusions, we're encouraging them to discover what the Bible actually says in his word. Our questions should teach them to observe, interpret, and to apply the truth. The mind then becomes the conduit for truth to reach the heart. In this way, we're moving them from not only discovering the truth, but also responding to the truth in their lives. So moving from facts to response. The Bible is living and active and speaks to all situations of everyday life, but it's often necessary for children to see those connections. How do we help them to apply what they are reading in the Bible to their own lives? 
I think Larry Richard's books create, book, Creative Bible Teaching, is a very helpful resource. He talks about five levels of learning. The first two levels of learning are rote and recognition. They stress facts. The teacher is active as the teller of these facts. So in the rote level, a child can repeat the facts without any thought of the meaning. You can see this in a toddler, for example, who can parrot a Bible verse, or a child who can tell you the facts of a Bible story, but he really doesn't understand the meaning of those facts. Um, for example, the story of baby Moses being found by Pharaoh's daughter, a child could tell you that mother made a basket and put Moses in the basket and put him in the river, and sister watched the basket and saw Pharaoh's daughter find Moses in the basket. They know the facts. Recognition, recognition is the ability to recognize biblical concepts. Um, you could also call this comprehension. They're comprehending the facts. For example, if you asked a child a multiple choice question about the facts, he could process the question and reflect an understanding answer. Why did mother put Moses in the basket? And the child should be able to pick out the answer because she couldn't hide him any longer. The next three levels, however, go beyond facts to meaning. In these levels, the teacher is not an active teller, but rather a guide. And the students are active participants rather than just listeners. So level three is restatement. And restatement is the ability to express or relate concepts to a biblical system of thought. The child understands the meaning in terms of biblical worldview. So this requires the child to do more than just recognize the truth, but also to relate that truth to other ideas. For example, why do you think mother had the idea to make a basket? The child has to take that and relate it to something else, and they may come up with something like, God gave her the idea as a way of protecting Moses. And that shows understanding that God interacts with man. In the last two levels of learning, relation and realization, or I like to say response, the student is able to understand the meaning in terms of his own life and personal experience. So relation is the ability to relate Bible truths to life and see an appropriate response to that truth. In other words, the, ch the child understands there's a relationship be tru between truth and his own life. Now that might be maybe a flash of insight, like, wow, I guess I don't have to worry about whether God can protect me on my camping trip. It could be something that's developed through a lot of questioning. Jimmy, do you ever worry about getting hurt? Yes, yeah, sometimes I'm afraid of storms. I sometimes wonder if my house is going to get struck by lightning. Does this story help you with your fears? Well, I think if God is big enough to take care of Moses in the river and protect him from being killed by Mo Pharaoh, he's big enough to take care of me. Um, so in order for the child to respond to the word of God, he must first understand how that scripture applies to his life. Jimmy, the next time you're afraid, what could you do? Well, I could remember about God taking care of Moses. Or I could remember that God is big He's strong and he can do anything. Or I could remember this verse. He must understand how he can act on the truth he has heard. It's important to help the child answer the question, what difference does this make in my life? It's not something you learn in a classroom. It's not something you learn sitting there, just sitting down with mom and dad. It's something you take into life. Once again, rather than tell the child the concepts, we have to lead them to discover the truth. Ask many questions. Encourage them to think. I remember asking my younger daughter questions. She'd say, oh, your questions are so hard. And I'd say, I know. You need to learn to think. And by the end of that year, which was she was five years old, she was asking me questions I couldn't answer. <laughs> so encourage them to think. Look up answers for themselves. Draw conclusions. And then move to encouraging children to respond to what they've discovered. You know, with a widespread rejection of external authority in Western culture, it's critical that we impress on children that we do not determine truth for ourselves. We are under the authority of the Word of God. God's, God clearly demands certain responses in His Word, and His Word clearly and concretely relates to the lives of all of us, including children. And that's why we think small group leading in Sunday school is so critical, because that personal intersection of the Word and the life of each student is discovered through dialogue. That's hard to do with 30 kids in a classroom. It's a lot easier to do with six kids in a small group. Following up on a student's comments in the small group setting gives opportunity to help the student discover personal application. 
The last stage is realization, or what I like to call response. And that's when a child makes a response to the truth. He applies that truth to daily life. He acts on the word instead of just hearing it. That's when Jimmy remembers that God is a big God. And next time he's in a fearful situation, he remembers the story of Moses and God's care. And he prays and he rests in God. That's response. So it takes time to get through these five levels, rote, recognition, restatement, and relation. But bringing your instruction of children to these levels helps them to make that final step of realization or response. So to summarize, we start by asking questions, leading children to draw biblical conclusions, which are linked in practical application to the child's life. So let's look at some examples. It's, okay, I've told you the theory. Let's look at some examples of how active learning can be combined with teaching toward a heart response in order to encourage faith. Here's an example. In preschool, perhaps you're telling the story of Nebuchadnezzar eating grass like a cow. We can begin by asking questions. For preschool, usually the obvious questions are told to the whole group. Do people eat grass? No. For preschool, in the small group time, you're going to basically going to be remembering the facts of the story. You know, you can show they know the main points. And then ask a question that will help them see the connection between their own life and the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar said, look at this great city I've made. Nebuchadnezzar thought he made that city all by himself. He forgot about God. He didn't thank God for helping him build the city. Do you ever forget to thank God? Now that's kind of an abstract question for a younger child. So then you get more concrete. Did you thank him for your breakfast today? Did you thank him for strong legs and arms? And then the child begins to see that involves him. He's in this truth too. Notice how I begin asking questions about the story, but lead to discovering how that truth applies to them. Do you ever forget to thank God? Did you thank him for whatever? In this manner, the mind becomes a conduit for reaching the heart. For older children, we're going to ask thought-provoking questions, encouraging them to discover concepts, leading them to draw conclusions, and ultimately to answer the question, how does this apply to me, and how does God ask me to respond to this? Another example would be from our Proverbs curriculum. Instead of telling children that God knows about things before they happen, a student's going to benefit more if we ask, does God know about things before they happen? How do you know that God knows about things before they happen? Can you give us some examples from the Bible of where we can learn that God knows things before they happen? And so now the students have to reach back into what they've learned and to try to apply that to what they're being asked right now. So they may say, well, God told Noah to build an ark before they'd even seen rain, much less a flood. Or Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny Jesus three times before he actually did it. Or God told uh, Mary through the angel that she was going to have a baby before she had the baby. They may even be able to articulate a memorized verse that explicitly states God's foreknowledge, like Isaiah 46, 9 and following. It says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. What then does that tell us about God, you might ask the children? If he knows everything, even those things that, you, that have not happened, can you trust his wisdom in your life? In this way, we're encouraging the children and the, the students not to accept merely our teaching, but to test everything with scripture to the end that the scripture will quicken their hearts to faith. When they see that God does indeed know about things before they happen, and they see proof of this from his word, there is the opportunity for the Holy Spirit then to lead them to marvel at this great God and to put their confidence 
in him. Another example from this one from Psalm 121. Ask the students to underline every instance of the word keep or some form of the word keep in that text. And then ask them, how many times did they see the word keep in that text? What point do you think the author of the psalm is making by saying keep so many times? Well, God is able to take care of us. We don't have to be afraid because the Lord is watching over us. And then the truth begins to engage the heart when you lead the student with a question like, how did God keep you today? Another example from Psalm 8611. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. What does that phrase tell you about walking in God's way? What does the teaching, or who is doing the teaching here? What does the name of the Lord mean? What does the name of the Lord in this context apply? What does it mean to walk in God's truth? What can you learn about this teaching from that last phrase, unite my heart to fear your name? And now we begin to move toward the student's heart. What does that word unite mean? What does the psalmist why does the psalmist use the word unite to talk about a heart? What do you think a divided heart would look like, or a heart that's not united? What would that look like? Where do you see evidence in yourself of a divided heart? Well, you can see from these examples that there are many different directions you can go in drawing out application through questioning. So we need to depend on the Holy Spirit who understands the child's heart and ask him to guide us as we ask questions. Share from your own faith experience. Let children see that the word of God is real to you. Let them see your affection for God and his word. Let them see how the truth convicts, guides, and encourages you. You know, children need a help in bridging between the theoretical and the practical, and it's our job to help them do that. Kids, and I've seen even adults, don't transfer what they learn to life experiences sometimes without help. But we can make those bridges in our lesson teaching, in our small group discussions, and our one-on-one -on -one conversations with children by being really practical and pulling the Bible into real life situations. It's very important to know the children in your church, to know what's going on in their lives, to make it a point to talk to them when you see them outside of class, talk to their parents to find out how to pray for them, what they're struggling with, then we're going to be more apt to be able to apply the Bible to their particular life situations. Now, obviously, parents have many more opportunities to guide their children toward application of Scripture. But teachers and small group leaders in the church setting can also point children in that direction through teaching and discussion. When we teach, we should aim for the heart. We should teach in such a way that we lead children to see what response the Word of God is asking of them. They need to know, what should I do in response to what I have heard? How is God calling me to respond? What is God asking of me? It's important to lead a child to the point where he is able to see what response the scripture requires, to see how he can be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. Then the Holy Spirit then gives the child an opportunity to respond. Here's an example. I was teaching a lesson on uh, the battlegrounds of fear. Um, the lesson explained there are two kinds of fear. There's a God-given fear that protects us from danger. That's a good thing. But there's also a spirit of fear that comes from the enemy to help keep us from doing what God wants us to do. The lesson then goes on to explain how to fight the spirit of fear. And it's, this explanation shows the relation between the child's life and biblical principles. Well, a few weeks after teaching that lesson, a child came up to me and he told me this. Mrs. Michael, I was lying in bed. I was really scared. And then I remembered what you said about fighting the fight of faith. So I said a fighter verse, and then I said another one, and then I said another one, and pretty soon I wasn't afraid anymore. Guess what, Mrs. Michael? Fighting the fight of faith really works. 
At that point, a child has responded to the truth that he has understood. And this is the fifth level of learning. It's in the heart. It's real. He knows that God works in the world. To summarize, we start by asking questions, leading children to draw biblical conclusions, which are linked in practical application to the child's life. Then the child must respond to the truth in a faith response of embracing the truth and acting upon it through the impulse of the Holy Spirit. So we need a body of knowledge, but the learner must also comprehend that, embrace it, and put it into practice. Though we cannot control the response of a child, we can help the child to see that a response is needed and what kind of response is needed. So linking knowledge and firsthand experience of the truth in real life situation helps the child to see the truth of the word. This experience then serves to further their understanding and if quickened by the Holy Spirit, to love the truth that is learned. Now, what do I mean by that? I remember learning in science class the law of physics that says two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. That was one of the few things I actually did understand in science class. It isn't too hard to figure out if these papers are here, um, something else cannot occupy the same space. That truth is mine. I owned it, I believed it, um, I, I knew that truth. I didn't really own it, I didn't really believe it. I could rattle it off, I could tell you what it meant, but you know what, when I was in college, I was in a car accident. And you know what came to my mind? Two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. <laughs> and you know what, that truth was mine. I owned it, I believed it, it was real to me because I had experienced it. You know, Job had the same experience, didn't he? He knew about God. He probably even knew God, had a personal relationship with God. But it wasn't a knowing of God that possessed him, an unshakable and intimate knowledge of God, a sense of awe and wonder and worship at the majesty of God, until the Lord laid him low, showed Job his frailties, and demonstrated his magnificence to Job. And this is what Job says in 42.5. I had heard of you, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. What was the difference? Job had an understanding of who God is, but then he experienced the majesty of God. Faith comes through knowledge of the word and the experience of testing the word and seeing God prove his word true, thus revealing he is who he says he is in everyday life. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which were able to make you wise through, for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. They have to know the sacred writings. They have to know the gospel, the facts of depravity and judgment, the purpose, purpose sacrifice of Jesus, the call of God, conversion, justification, adoption. But faith is more than knowing. Psalm 34.8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I had a colleague who one time told me about this Italian dish that his godmother used to make for him. And he was saying, oh, it has hard-boiled egg in it. It's wrapped in pasta and spices. You roll it up. You put it in spaghetti sauce. He had this huge smile on his face, this faraway look in his eyes, the loving memory of that dish. Well, I'm Italian. I have garlic in my veins. And I put it in everything but cake. But though I heard what Fred said by the hearing of the ear, my eyes have not seen it, and I haven't tasted it, so I've never experienced it, and I don't love it. I know about this dish. Taste means to experience. Put God to the test. Step out and trust him and see that he is who he says he is. So in summary, it's absolutely crucial that we impart knowledge of the truth to our children. Gaining knowledge and understanding is absolutely essential and we must be faithful to impart knowledge, but we can't be satisfied with just the transfer of knowledge. Knowledge of the word must lead our children to faith. We teach what our fathers have told us, not just because we desire them to know about God, but because we desire them to put their confidence in God, their hope, their trust in him, and find him as the source of their heart satisfaction, counting everything else as rubbish for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. 
This is why we must also teach in a way that aims toward the heart and encourages a response of faith. So we would plead with you to seize the opportunity of each day and weave all this teaching into everyday life and encourage children not just to hear these things, but to see who God is, to taste and see that he is good. When a child responds to the truth, a child learns that God is real, his word can be trusted, he has an experience with a living God. And that's why helping them to understand how the Bible applies to his own life and encouraging him to respond to God is so important. Now, the Bible can be learned at any of these five levels, but the goal of good Bible teaching is to encourage the child to engage in response to the Word. So the, the reason why it's so important for the church to connect, connect with the home and with parents is because of this fact that engaging the heart takes more than what we can do typically in a classroom setting. We have a lot to offer in the church to the children. We can give them systematic weekly teaching and this helps to build a wonderful foundation of scriptural understanding for our children, which is crucial as we've seen. In the classroom we try to go beyond just imparting knowledge and we can do some of that because we know that knowledge alone is going to create those little Pharisees, those who know the word but have hearts that are far from the Lord. Knowledge can reach the mind but it doesn't always influence the heart and the will and we know that. Um, our children may know the word without knowing the word giver and that's why we try in the church setting to not just put children, 30 children, and one teacher in a classroom. We want them to be able to interact with the truth. We want them to be able to take what they've heard in the lesson and be able to apply it to the heart. We want to help kids understand and engage with what they're learning through demonstrations and role plays and illustrations. We include the small group application venue so the children can talk about how to apply the lesson and what God might be asking of them in response to the lesson. But the classroom has its limitations. We cannot create or manufacture in the classroom all the life experiences that are gonna help that child be able to engage with the truth. Parents have those kinds of opportunities every day. Every day the Holy Spirit puts children into situations where they have the opportunity to apply the truth that they've learned and to see God working in their lives. But unless parents are there seizing those moments, the word that was taught stays disconnected to real life or it's forgotten or it's disbelieved or it's considered irrelevant or even tragically, it will bear witness against the soul of the children. Children are accountable for the truth that they've been taught, and that same truth can either condemn them or it can save them. When we see children for a few hours a week, we're limited in our ability to be able to help them to apply the truth to life. But God has placed parents in the unique position of influence in the lives of their children and has charged them with the responsibility to talk of him throughout the day. This is why partnership with the home, between the church and the home, is so important. Parents must know what their children are learning so that they can help the, church, the children apply then what they've learned to the fabric of everyday life. Unless parents know what their child or young adult is learning at church, they're not going to be able to apply the truth in the coming and going of life. But here's what can happen in everyday experiences when parents are informed of what their children are learning and they seize the opportunities the Holy Spirit provides. Uh, in one of our curriculums, The Way of the Wise, uh, it talks about the different kinds of fools. And one of the fools in the book of Proverbs is the simple fool. You see it in Proverbs 14, 15. A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thoughts to his steps. Now, a ch child might understand that concept, even have of the verse memorized, without agreeing and following God's instruction. And that's where a parent's instruction is so helpful. Suppose that a child, uh, a boy's cousin said to him, 
something like, you know, playing the piano is a girl thing. So all of a sudden, that boy doesn't want to learn, doesn't want to take piano lessons anymore. So the parent has an opportunity at that point to apply the truth that's been learned. Knowing that his or her child had a lesson the simple fool, the parent could say, you know, you can either just listen to what your cousin says without checking it out or thinking about it like the simple fool, or you can give thought to your steps. Do you know any grown men who play the piano? We don't want to be simple fools, do we? Just doing what someone else suggests. We need to ask God to help us think about what we're doing, to pay attention, and to pray. That can start a conversation that might help the child apply the truth that he has learned. Perhaps you have a, child, a shy child, and this child is learning um, the names of God through How Majestic Is Your Name. And the child is in a store, and there's no price on a book that she wants to buy. And wants you, the parent, to ask the sales clerk the price. Now, knowing that your child has learned a lesson on Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, you could answer like this. You know, I could do that for you. But then you would continue to be afraid of things like this. I would not be loving you if I did not help you grow. Do you believe that God is Jehovah Jireh? That God will provide what you need when you need it? Well, one of the things that God promises to provide his children is his strength when they are weak. It's hard for you to ask the clerk the price, but it isn't hard for God. You can either put the book back and go home without it, or you can ask God, who made all things, who split the Red Sea, who rescued Daniel from the lion's den, to give you the strength and courage to go up to that cashier and say, can you please tell me the price on this book? I know this is true because it's happened with my daughter and I. And we prayed, and she had the courage, and she went up to that cashier and she asked the price because God, who is strong, helped her. Kids and even adults don't transfer what we learn in life experiences sometimes without some help. And the Holy Spirit gives countless opportunities for the truth that has been taught to sink into the heart and the will. But the Holy Spirit works through diligent parents who have their radars up to these opportunities and who are prepared with the knowledge of what their children are learning. Parents who love God and his word, who seek to bring God into every situation. And for those children who are from unchurched homes, partnering those children with a host family from your church is a way that those children can also have that application in everyday life. Here's an example of how a parent astutely um, applied the truth her child learned. Uh, this little boy was learning about the providence of God, and uh, he had grown very tall that year, and he had outgrown his bike. Um, it was just too small for him. Grandma must have noticed, and she called and left a message on the answering machine saying that she wanted to buy a bike for this child. This is really unusual for Grandma to do. She wasn't the kind of grandma that calls and offers to buy bikes. Mom knew what this child had been learning in Sunday school and said to him, why do you think that happened? And he said, it's the providence of God. God knew I needed a bike and he encouraged Grandma to get one. <laughs> you see what has just happened? Gratitude is transferred now from Grandma to God, where it belongs. And the child can respond with, to God with affection and worship. Parent resource sheets are not colored scraps of paper. They may make the difference between life and death for a child. Not that parents necessarily have to do what's on that multicolored outline sheet, but they need to know what their children are learning so they can bring that truth into the lives, of everyday, into everyday experiences. As stated earlier, we cannot make that response for the child, but we can lead them to see what the response is. We can teach in such a way that they understand possible responses and that a response is necessary. So the heart lessons are going to more likely be learned through experience than they are through 
sitting in a classroom and that's what we're after. We want it to get from the head into the heart. And sometimes we need to set up those experience, experiences for our children so that they can learn. This example is from a book called Repentance and Faith by Charles Walker. He writes, my little daughter was playing one day with a few beads, which seemed to delight her wonderfully. Her whole soul seemed to be absorbed in her beans, beads. And I said, my dear, you have some pretty beads there. Yes, Papa. And you seem to be vastly pleased with them. Yes, Papa. Well, now, throw them into the fire. The tears started to well into her eyes. She looked earnestly at me as though she ought to have a reason for such a crucial, cruel sacrifice. Well, my dear, do as you please, but you know I never told you to do anything which I did not think would be good for you. She looked at me a few moments longer and then summoning up all her fortitude, her breast heaving with the effort, she dashed them into the fire. Well, said I, there, let them lie. You shall hear more about them in another time, but say no more about them now. Some days after, I brought her a box full of larger beads and toys of the same kind. When I returned home, I opened the treasure and set it before her. She burst into tears with joy. Those, my child, said I, are yours because you believed me when I told you it would be better for you to throw those two or three paltry beads into the fire. Now, that has brought you this treasure. But now, my dear, remember, as long as you live, what faith is. I did all this to teach you the meaning of faith. You threw your beads away because I bade you because you had faith in me that I never advised you, but for your good. Put the same trust in God. Believe everything that he says in his word, whether you understand it or not. Have faith in him that he means to do you good. It's very unlikely that parents today would teach their children this way. Why? I believe it's because we live in a culture of comfort. We have our values reversed. And though we never dare to admit it, we often treat our children as though we prefer eternal torment for them rather than have them pain and discomfort now. We have produced an indulged generation that's mostly ungrateful, mostly demanding. And this is not the way the Lord teaches his children. He let his people feel consequences of actions. The Old Testament is full of consequences for disobedience and is full of rewards for obedience. Experience is a good teacher. Both bad and good experiences teach us. And when the Holy Spirit brings difficult experiences into our children's lives, we must have the faith to trust God in these life experiences and not hinder our children from learning. Encourage them to trust God in the big and the little things of life, to step out in faith and to see God at work in the universe. When our daughter Christy, who's here today, she can verify the story if she remembers, uh, probably, I don't know, fourth, fifth grade, somewhere in there, we had a 19... 80 Pontiac Bonneville station wagon and in the back was these um, these little wing windows that just kind of turned this way and that was the only windows that opened in the back and we had been up in northern Minnesota and I had a little sailboat that I pulled with a boat trailer and that was connected to the car and Christy and Amy are in the back seat playing with their dolls and I, actually, Christy, I think, was playing with her dolls. And um, she's back there playing. And uh, all of a sudden says, well, where's my doll coat? 
I don't know, where's your doll coat? And I was just here, where's my doll coat? Amy, did you take my doll coat? Amy didn't take her doll coat. Where is it? She starts looking around. Where's the doll? Well, Christy, where did you have it last? Well, I hung it right here on this window. Uh, we knew what happened to your doll coat. And I didn't, there's some scientific principle, I'm sure, that she didn't understand that creates this vacuum when you're going 55 miles an hour down Highway 371 and sucked her doll coat right out. And she said, Daddy, could you go back and find it? Okay, the sun is setting, divided highway, 55 miles an hour. There's no way. I have no clue when this thing flew out the window. It could have been hours, well, many, many minutes ago. No, Christy, we can't go back. It's gone. You just face it. This is one of life, crises in life. Just <laughs> well, well, Daddy, would it help to pray? Well... How would you answer that question? <laughs> Christy, it always helps to pray. And so I look in my mirror and there that little head is bowed and those lips are moving in prayer to God. And on we go down Highway 371. And the sun is now set and I'm looking out my side mirror and I see something flopping on the trailer. I pulled off and I said, Christy, the Lord heard your prayer. I walked back, unhooked that coat from the fender of that boat trailer and brought it up and handed my daughter. Let's not ever underestimate what God might be pleased to do through the crisis experiences in our children's life. Let's not hesitate to encourage them to trust God to reveal himself to our children in a way that they will never forget. Use the Bible in everyday life. The Bible's living and active. It's relevant for all of life. If you love God and his word, the word of God should flow naturally out of your heart. It should be part of everyday conversation. It should be the solution to problems, the daily instructor to your children. Here's an example. Perhaps you have a child who's nervous about a piano recital and says, Mom, I'm scared about playing in front of all those people. I'm afraid I'm going to forget my peace. Now, there are two kinds of responses that we can give that child. The first one is this. Susie? You've practiced very hard, and you really play your piece well. You might be nervous, but when you get up there, your fingers will remember what to do. Just concentrate on playing the piano and forget about the people. I know you'll do just fine. Now, that may be reassuring, but it does not impart the words of life. It does not turn a child Godward. It points the child to himself or herself. So there's another response. Susie, I know you're nervous. And I'm going to give you a verse to hang on to. Psalm 125, 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Do you know what that verse means? You can go up to that piano and trust in your ability and how much you practice and that is all you will have to trust in. Or you can go up to that piano trusting in the God of the whole universe. You can walk up to that piano and say, Jesus, I am trusting in you. I am in your hands. Place my hands in your hands today. And you play that piano piece knowing that God is on your side. And no matter what happens, no matter how you play that piece, if you are trusting in God, you will not be shaken. You will stand strong and firm, and the loving arms of God will be around you just like the mountains around Jerusalem. He will be in front of you and behind you and on your right side and on your left side. He will surround you with his love as you play that piano. So when you play that piano, you play it for him not to show off your ability or to entertain the audience, but as a way to say, thank you, Jesus, for being with me. 
one of the dangers of children growing up in Christian homes is that they can know the Bible and they can know all the right answers and they, can never, and they may never know the God of the Bible or never know or love the truth that they've been taught. They can know all about Jesus but never come to have a life transforming encounter with the living Savior. Christian psychologist Donald Sloat wrote a book 25 years ago called The Dangers of Growing Up in a Christian Home. So Sloat explains that there is a problem, this is quoting from page 27, when youngsters accept what their parents have taught them without questioning or evaluating it. They're simply following hollow beliefs that can crumble easily under pressure. This is especially true when Christian parents do not ch teach children to think for themselves. It's easy for succeeding generations to go along with their parents' teachings as, and as a result, they live out traditions that have little or no personal meaning. Our regular prayer, not only for our own children and grandchildren, but for the children of our church, is that Paul's words in Romans 121 would not be true for them. That although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Our desire is not just that children will understand the truth, but they embrace it for themselves and that they respond to it. And this is ultimately a work of the Holy Spirit. We can't change a heart. Only God can do that. We can't produce faith in a child. Hebrews 12.2 says, Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of their faith. He's the one that can produce faith in our children. We can, however, be faithful teachers of the word, faithful proclaimers of the truth, trusting that God will use our efforts to touch and to shape the hearts of our children. The most effective way to reach the heart is through the faithful teaching of the word of God by loving and authentic believers. We must be careful not to underestimate in that teaching the power that the word of God has, which again, we want you to hear that this week. The word of God is mighty. Hebrews 4, 12 says, the word of God is living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Or over in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We must also realize that some children will respond to the faithful teaching of the word in unbelief and in disobedience. Even though they may not vocalize it or admit it, this should not surprise us or unduly discourage us if we see evidence that our children are not embracing the truth. Many children in our classrooms are unregenerate. We must keep challenging their hearts to respond in faith to the truth while being fervent in prayer that the Holy Spirit will touch and quicken those hearts to faith. The power of conversion is not in the words that we're delivering. It is in the work of the Holy Spirit. Through the truth that has been sown through faithful, yet very imperfect truth tellers. The word of God has converting power. It has transforming power because the word is powerful and God is powerful and converts and transforms hearts. Conversion is a work of the Holy Spirit, not a matter of our skill. We can't cause a child's heart to love the truth in such a way that he embraces Jesus as a Savior and Lord. Yet we are called to teach the truth with that ultimate goal in mind. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 7 says, I planted, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, 
but only God who gives the growth. As teachers, we're called to plant. We're called to water the word of truth. And we do this by planting knowledge in the mind and then continually watering that knowledge by encouraging that heart to respond. But only God can decisively cause that dormant seed to come to life and to grow. Often we don't see God doing that because it's underneath the soul, underneath the soil, in the soul, within the heart of the child. This truth should give teachers and parents great hope that ultimately the faith of our children does not rest on us. Our imperfect efforts or our children's intellectual proficiency, rather the faith of the next generation rests on the saving work of a good and a sovereign God who will accomplish his perfect purposes for our children. Finally, our teaching to reach the heart involves heart preparation. Teaching toward heart application takes time, effort, thought, prayer, and preparation. If the teacher or parent has first struggled with applying the truth to his own life, he will be teaching from the heart and not just from the head. To get to this level of teaching will take longer, it will take more effort, because we first must have our own hearts engaged with the word and responding to God. Listen to these words again from Luke Priolo and teach them diligently. There is no effective shortcut to studying the Bible for yourself. To rely solely on someone else's preparation of God's word for your children is to neglect the first part of Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Someone has said that a message prepared in a mind reaches a mind, but a message prepared in a life reaches a life. In other words, the more of God's word you have internalized for yourself, the more effectively you'll be able to properly indoctrinate your children in scriptures. How do you lead a child to understand a desire to act on an appropriate response to biblical truth? You first have to clearly understand the truth. The way that you authentically lead children to see the response that God's word is asking of them is encur and encourage them to make that response is to first live that scripture yourself. Ask yourself what, God, what response God is asking you to make. Ask him for the strength to be a doer of the word and then act appropriately in response to God's word. It may require humbling ourselves before God, admitting our need of him. It may require going to someone we have offended. This probably is not going to happen if we pick up a Sunday school lesson on Saturday night to prepare to teach in the morning. This will not happen in everyday life if a parent is not reading the word and responding in obedience to the word. This is going to require struggling with the Bible passage you'll be teaching. This will require looking at the Bible lesson at least a week in advance and asking God to change you through his word. It is a great privilege to work with children in Sunday school. And because if you take your job seriously, you can experience tremendous spiritual growth. Example, perhaps you're preparing a lesson on the name of Jesus, Overcomer. The main ideas of that lesson are Jesus will return with great power and authority and crush the powers of evil, and Jesus can help you walk in victory in the battles of your life. One of the application questions in that lesson is, are there areas in your life in which you are defeated? You can read the lesson, ask the Lord to show you where you experience defeat, which means humbling yourself before the Lord, and say, Lord, I know this is not just a lesson for the children in my class. This is a lesson for me. Show me this week where I am defeated, where I give in to sin, and then show me how you are my overcomer. This takes time to discover. This is why a teacher needs to take time to prepare a lesson reading through the lesson early in the week in anticipation of teaching at the end of the week. As the week unfolds, the Lord will show you an area or areas of your life where you're defeated. It may be an attitude like discouragement or a complaining spirit. It might be a specific situation or a particular person really irritates you. And you have a hard time responding graciously to that person or encouraging that person. You confess your sin and ask the Lord to help you by being your overcomer. 
Lord, I just can't seem to look at the positive side of things. It's so much easier for me to complain about things. I need you to be my overcomer in this attitude. The Lord will then give you opportunity to trust him to be your overcomer. He will bring situations and circumstances in your life where you can put into action the truth that has gripped your heart. When the word of God has been life-changing to you, you are in a better position to share from your heart and to help children to understand how the word of God applies to their situation. And remember, God is not just working on that truth for one lesson. He's working on it for a lifetime. It may start with that lesson, but let me tell you, at 57, you're still learning the basic lessons. Um, one more thing is, I know how easy it is for us to read the word of God and put it down and say, okay, now I've had my Bible time, and not be changed by it. If we will be good teachers, we have to be changed by the Word of God. I remember sitting down one day and reading, um, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, um, sincere, open to reason. Um, if I weren't quoting in front of you, I'd remember it. But anyways, um, I remember reading that verse and saying, I gotta stop and I gotta think about this. Meditate on the word. What is pure wisdom? What is wisdom that is open to reason? What does that look like when I'm sitting in a meeting that my wisdom is open to reason, that it is sincere, that it's full of good works and humility? It took me the Holy Spirit working in my heart all week long and the next week and the next week as I learned that passage, which you probably won't believe now. I did learn that passage. <laughs> And thought, it just kept humming in my background. I'm sitting in a meeting. Wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, open to reason, full of mercy and good works. How am I demonstrating that? Lord, what does that mean for me right now? This is what we need to do if we will teach authentically to our children. Sorry. Don't apologize. <laughs> well, if you take all that we've shared with you this afternoon and go home and say, okay, we're overhauling everything when we get back to church. I can assure you, it will not all be welcomed with open arms. <clears throat> Let me share with you three common objections that we've heard over the years. And, and I, just with that regard, just really encourage you um, for patience. Sally will tell the story. I mean, we were at Bethlehem for 15 years before we started to see some of the changes we'd been hoping for and praying for. And so um, sometimes the greater mistake is to try to move too quickly, and, and especially when you're talking about foundational things. But three common objections. Number one, this is really too much to expect children to do, to study the Bible. Children can't sit and listen that long, especially little children. Our response would be, yes, it can be tough for a child to sit five minutes if they're not interested in what's being taught. But if a child is interested and engaged with what's being taught, 30 minutes is gonna go by very quickly. We'd also say that children will rise to the level of expectation. If you set the standard high, they're gonna strive for it. If you set the standard low, they're gonna settle for it. We would also say children sit and li listen often a lot longer in school, at least I hope so. Some of the best education in this country happened in one room schoolhouses where high expectations were placed on children. Behind this objection often is the underestimation of what children are capable of. We balk at having children work in Sunday school. We think that learning one verse a week is some phenomenal achievement for a child. Well, Muslim children in Niger are memorizing the Quran. And the goal is that they learn all 114 chapters of the Quran by the time that they're adolescents and to comprehend the message of each of those chapters. Objection number two, many of the truths in the Bible are too difficult for children to understand or too weighty for them to handle. You should stick to simple Bible stories. 
Well, children are able to understand deep truths much deeper than we realize. Their souls long for depth. They don't want the same watered down truth over and over. But we do need to explain those truths in a way that they can understand. For example, you can teach the sovereignty of God to preschoolers, but you would say it this way, God is the boss of everything. God is in charge. They can also handle difficult truths. They don't ha have the emotional hang-ups that adults have. They don't have the life experiences to color their acceptance of that truth or to make that truth difficult for them. Children are very matter-of-fact. If the Bible says it, then it's true. Here's an example. In the Promises curriculum, we have a lesson called um, the way of the where we teach the verse, the way of the wicked will perish. If you know Jesus, you are going to heaven. If you don't, you won't. In the names curriculum, we have God is the judge of the whole earth. There will, be, there will come a judgment day, and those who are not trusting in Jesus will be condemned to hell. In Jesus, what a Savior, we teach them man is sinful and deserving of hell. As John Piper said, you need to know your plight before you can recognize the rescue. What are we protecting children from? They need to know the hard truths so they can rejoice in redemption. We do teach them lessons like God will be with you in the hard times. If you persevere under trial, you will be rewarded. God will deliver you from all your troubles. Yes, you are, if you're a Christian, you will have troubles. <clears throat> no, but these may be heavy lessons for the adults who are teaching them, but these are not heavy lessons for children. Many children have not yet had experience in suffering. So they're not emotional issues for them, they're academic issues. But by giving them a theology of suffering, they are not surprised when it happens, and they have strong doctrine and biblical truth to sustain them in the hard times of life, which will come. <laughs> Let me add that it's important to present truth in an age-appropriate way. I think it's beneficial to tell preschoolers the story of David's sin with Bathsheba, but it should be explained in an appropriate preschool manner. For preschoolers, I would define David's sin this way. David stole another man's wife, and he acted like she was his wife. The point for preschoolers is not the specific sin that David did, but that even a man after God's own heart sins, that God punishes sins, and he extends mercy to his people. The last objection we'll mention is that Sunday school should be fun. Children learn by doing. They need to play games and do activities. Otherwise, they will get B-O-R-E-D, bored. And we don't want our children to be bored in Sunday school. Well, we're not interested in boring children either. We want them to have a good time when they come. But our aim is for the children to be engaged in what they're learning. So often we connect, or we think that for a child to enjoy what they're doing, we must entertain them. And the nature of entertainment is that it enables the mind to disengage, typically. You know, when you come home at night and you just want to veg out, dis disconnect, sit in front of a movie or something, it, it enables the mind to disengage. We don't want the joy that our exper children experience in learning to be lost through entertainment. Our aim should be in, to engage them, not simply entertain them with time-consuming activities that offer very little spiritual benefit. There are lots of opportunities for children to have fun in life but few of them will challenge their souls. We're swimming here against a cold current in the culture, even a current in the church culture. But when a young person is 16 years old and facing the loss of her mother to leukemia, I don't think any of us are going to think, it's too bad she didn't have more fun and games in Sunday school to help her deal with this experience in life. By the grace of God, we hope that she will be able to say, 
we will be able to say, we gave her a solid foundation for understanding suffering and that by his grace, she will trust in his sovereign wisdom and his love, even in this most difficult trial. Children should not be bored in Sunday school. If they're bored, they're often passive listeners. They should be actively participating in the learning process. We expect them to answer questions and to ask questions and to look things up in the Bible and to think about the meaning of something and to respond to what they're reading and to participate in illustrations and role plays and demonstrations. And besides that, the Bible itself is not a boring book because the God of the Bible is not boring. He opens seas. He defeats a giant through a boy with a sling and a stone. He makes the sun stand still. He sends hailstones down on his enemy. He pays his taxes in a fish's mouth. He defeats an or enormous army with 300 men with lanterns and trumpets. He makes the walls of a city fall down. He heals paralyzed people and he walks on water. He is not a boring God, we have the most exciting story in the world to share with our children. Why should we substitute it with games and activities and have truths that have no life? When children and youth are bored with God's word, it may often be, and this is what gets us in trouble when we even suggest it sometimes, could it be that maybe the condition of your heart, your child's heart is not where it ought to be? When a person is spiritually dead, he will not find the Bible very interesting or relevant. The answer to spiritual deadness is not more games or entertainment in Sunday school. It's the earnest prayer for the hearts of our children. John 6, 64 says, Jesus says, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not to go, want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered them, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we're not going to conceal them from our children. But tell the generation to come the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. Let's not conceal the words that lead to life from our children. Let's not presume that God is unable to work in their hearts and to bring about a love for his word and an eagerness to hear deep truth. Let's not conceal the living God of the universe as he has revealed himself through this book. Let's not set our children up to fall at the hands of the enemy because we've failed to put a sword in their hand and to teach them how to use it. Let's tell the generation to come the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord and his strength and the wondrous works that he has done and that he is still doing today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, that is our earnest desire. We, we're, we're, we're up against such a gravitational pull in our culture that, that wants to draw our hearts away from the very things that lead to this life. Hearts of teachers and hearts of our children, hearts of our parents to become so consumed with the things that have no eternal value. Lord, I pray that you'll just take the little loaves and the fishes of this effort this afternoon and use it, Lord, to multiply and multiply it to feed thousands, I pray. Those here and those who are influenced by what our ears have heard today. Lord, would you do in the culture of our churches and the culture of our cities, towns in which we live, Lord, would you do what we can't do in ourselves? Would you turn the hearts of people away from the things of the world toward the things of Christ? And would you be pleased to use our meager little efforts to accomplish that for the glory of your name and for the eternal joy of these people? We ask it, Lord, now in the matchless 
name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen.